Good morning. Thank you, panelists, for actually being here. So we kind of know each other from before. Um, and maybe we'll just jump straight in. Maybe we'll start with Akina and, and move our way down. Um, same question for everyone. What are some of the areas that you've been working on in the digital space that has wowed you in the last six to 12 months? Wow. Should I think ladies should go first. Absolutely. That's why okay. you're beside me. Uh, digital, well, six, you said six to nine months. Yeah, unless that's really impressed you, things that you've worked on wow. or you've seen. Yeah. Um, I guess right now, I mean, touch upon what you just talked about, about metaverse NFT. So I've been, because uh, I'm also in the investment committee for our group, and uh, been looking into NFT and metaverse and how does it impact businesses. And you might think, oh my God, that's like something, we're talking about spaceships, but SpaceX is already there. And so uh, regardless in what industry you're in, you have to look at NFT, metaverse and crypto. If for those who, this is like foreign language French to me sometimes, right? So you can see cryptocurrency as a currency trans that you will buy assets. NFT is assets, your boat, your buildings, uh, your art pieces, your collectibles, anything that are asset owned in physical world can be NFT. And metaverse is the world where your NFT will reside. So your physical assets will live in the virtual world. So right now, if you don't believe in it, uh, real estate developers are buying virtual land in a game. And then they will build properties and things like that. And they will rent out to players that want to live in the building. And they're really using real money to rent or buy a property online. So, I mean, if you don't believe in it, ask your five, six, seven year old kids, if they're playing robot, that's it. So that's, I think, that's the most interesting for the past six, nine months I'm looking into. Hey, thanks, Akina. Next. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a really good point. We can certainly talk more about metaverse. I think one thing I would take out of what you said, Akina, and what I've seen in the last six, nine, 12, 18 months is the speed of development and the speed of kind of convergence between the physical and digital world, whether metaverse or even in our regular, you know, meetings and other types of life. Um, I saw that I saw a statistic that uh, companies were able to achieve in the post pandemic world, mm -hmm. kind of like a 25 X multiple on some of the projects they wanted to complete. Right. So where in the past we may have spent a year planning and then a year implementing and all these kinds of for technology. This is no longer acceptable. So even for myself in my day to day job in my life, I feel constant pressure on myself from myself looking at what's happening in crypto more other, so than your previous job more well, <laughs> no there's never any greater pressure than working in consultant right but um yeah no i, I seriously yeah, think a it's a big job, change Michael. and if we're not you know talking with our management and, and putting pressure on each other from from digital back to maybe traditional lines of business like the coo or ceo then i don't think we're we're upholding our duty yeah i think i tend to agree with the two speakers here as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I feel stressful as well because like being overwhelmed from <laughs> those, those like, you know, information and news about like cryptocurrencies, like metaverse right now. Uh, th that's definitely something that no matter what kind of industry that we should look into, uh, you know, seriously. And uh, we're getting like, you know, for nine months, six months or a 12 month wrap. I think one of the things like, I, I agree with you a lot well, on uh, with Adam about the speed of like how you transform your, your stealth. You can't wait, either like small win, big win, of course, like you need to get support from your like executive, like board or the stealth, and that, that's a hard thing, but we just need to get well prepared for your strategy and what you want to do. And then you can't wait for another like, see, like a few months or whatever to can do. I, can I right. Absolutely. comment speed about yeah. that? Absolutely. Because I just, like, I, I just recently posted a video uh, you know, on, on LinkedIn and then, uh, you know, a doctor responded to my uh, post and basically I, I quoted the Moore's Law about speed. Yeah. The Moore's Law basically said, you know, for every two years, the capacity of the chips, size and memories and speeds double every two years. What it means that, well, and we're not talking about chips, we're talking about transformation and how uh, technology has changed things. What technology has transferred uh, in terms of 
knowledge, uh, data, um, efficiency, performance, two years ago will double next two years and vice versa. So meaning that 10 years, 20 years ago, the impact of technology like the internet and the iPhone impact to us what we see now will double, more than triple, double, quadruple for the next two years. That's how fast technology, and you don't adapt now and change now, you're gonna be late into the game. Thank you. Maybe a question to Adam. Adam, you've joined, you're with Trico right now as the CDO, and certainly Trico is undergoing tremendous transformation to become very, to become a digital business in there. What's it like being the heart of such a digital transformation from a, what I call maybe a legacy business that's very stable, you know, and known to, to, about to us be digital? Now. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll get to two of you afterwards. Yeah. I'm, just <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I think it's, it's a, a fair point. And I joined in November 2020, so coming up on one year. And when I looked at the, the organization, um, certainly there'd already been some shoots of kind of the internal transformation internal digitization, automation, uh, a little bit of analytics, those types of things. But then also there were some uh, public or market facing uh, digitization efforts as well. So there was already a little bit of a start. And, you know, I guess what I would say is you kind of sometimes take the bad with the good, uh, whether it's tax accounting or uh, audit or the business we do with corporate services, business services. Yes, it's stable and uh, a, a traditional or a legacy business, but the upside of it and what partially attracted me was you also have a big client base. So when it comes to, to building digital experiences for clients, you've got to find uh, what are the advantages for your type of organization. If you're one of those unicorns, that's a B2C company and you're growing in Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's about releasing the best experience always fighting for that next one or two customers. For us, it's about providing uh, a digital experience that amplifies the, the skills and capabilities of the people that we have and the place that we have in terms of trust with our clients. Uh, so instead of trying to look at it like, oh geez, it's kind of hard to, to uh, digitize a, a traditional business, I more tend to look at it and see what are the strengths that we do have and how can we apply that to, to the um, the type of digitization that we're doing. Uh, so maybe I'll give a more practical example, not, not to talk on for too long here, but um, we call our digital experience more like a digital front door to, to start with, right? So it's about giving clients things that they didn't have in the past, 24 by seven access to data, uh, a, a messaging or chat service with some of our staff that they didn't have access to before, those types of things that amplify the capabilities or strengths that we have while bringing some digital into the business. Uh, I, think, I like that. I think my takeaways from what you just said was becoming a digital flow follower in this industry with a stable customer base in there, it's not about trying to be on the bleeding edge. It's about uplifting, uplifting the capabilities and also being true to who you are as an organization. Yeah, I think it's fair. I think that's one. And the second thing is, you know, we, I shared um, earlier about Companies will go to their front office digital transformations, and that's important. But if your middle or back office is, is, is lagging, go look for Adam at Trico. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe on to William, right? In, in your industry and in what you're doing, how is that quite different? I mean, trying to get to 25x or 100x seems to be in the old days, right? Seems, seems to be it's a long time, a lot of high risk to actually get there. But what we've seen in the newer, younger companies now, you know, if it's not 100x, it's not worth talking about. Uh, I think, you know, just like, you know, regular for most of the like uh, public developers in Hong Kong, you know, they have to deal with a lot of the legacy system. Yeah. That, that put it this way, right? But like, we need to, for somehow, thanks to, probably I shouldn't use thanks, okay, for to uh, COVID-19. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then this uh, companies, they start looking at their business like differently, okay? Because I, before that, like maybe digital touch point is only optional, all right? But now they know that like, not all the people are willing to go to the shopping mall physically. And then they think that, they start to realize that, okay, uh, digital is the prime become, suddenly become primary touch point if you want your customer back to the, the mall. So we start, you know, accelerated like really fast because like it's much easier as I, because I just joined the company like for two and a half years 
and then the, the first years like before COVID before, and then it took a little bit longer time, definitely to just like get some initiative moving, right? Not only about to getting budget, that's such like, you know, talking with the stakeholders, like oh, what would we want to do? And they say, oh, is there any urgency at all? And then maybe probably not because like if they don't, they didn't do anything, they still get rental, right? You know what I mean, right? You know, we just like ran something and then, but now they know that, okay, you want your customer back. And now we're not talking about, like, I talked to Akina before about that, you know, even though we have shopping malls in Hong Kong, right? We're not actually competitors. We were not yeah, alone. We don't compete. We actually help each other. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing to compete on unless we sell properties. And then that's a different yeah, okay. But I don't know different things. So yeah, you, you can get several properties yeah. from different developers, right? Yeah. So it's not coming from rest. All right. So, yeah. Right, right. So but anyway, so uh so that's why we were celebrating a lot and then we start like collecting data. Uh but it's really much faster. I think it's much more convincing. Uh you take much less time, you know, to convince to encourage your colleagues and stakeholders that we need to move faster. I think that that's one of the things that change a lot. Just in so let's drill that, drill into that. Convincing your stakeholders. I, yeah. I can imagine it's been quite hard and I'll come to Akina afterwards yeah, on, on the same topic. What are some interesting things? How do you convince these property tycoons who understand the real estate business to say, let's invest in this new areas, which it's even hard to explain. So, How do you um, get about doing that? And, and has your voice risen up even more up the food chain so that people are calling you up now and say, hey, William, what's this you know, NFT? What's a metaverse? Why is it that people are investing in Dogecoin or, or Shiba Inu, right? Like, do you get these kind of calls these days? Uh, luckily, not, not that often. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but more, more, more often is like, uh, I, I need to raise, you know, I need to like, maybe like emphasize or even though like um, magnifies, you know, the pain point that we are facing or we are going to face. You're too nice. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 you have to do it some, some in a nice way, all right? Yeah. Otherwise they, they won't listen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so you need to, and I tell them, you know, what, what would be the quick win and the, the biggest impact, okay? But uh, regarding all those stuff, and, and they, they, they will come, you know, I will get some inquiry from time to time, but not that often. Not that often. Yeah. So we'll compare it to Akina, because you probably get a lot of these WhatsApps and calls in here, say, Akina, what's happening? No, actually, uh, no one dared to ask me what's happening, because I have too much going on. <laughs> so they just don't want me to come tell them what I want to do. So, I mean, I, I, William, that's you know, one of the things that we're taught in corporate world, right? And then in school and everything is to persuade your management to say, these are the benefits, these are the the risk and then if you don't do it you know this is what will happen to you i think that's in the past when you have 20 you know like months or something to persuade someone to make a decision the time is no longer the same what it was the past you are not allowed to have that kind of luxury anymore so i was talking about the one third one third theory that i came up with based on my years of experience i know i look younger than that like you said i'm a millennial thanks adam Right? I'm not a millennial, and I have 20 years of change management experience in public companies, startups, and you know uh, SMEs and stuff like that. If you want to be a successful CDO, there's a couple roles you need to play. You need to be a cook. Sometimes you need to cook something up and tease them and uh, appetite them, you know, in a way to feel like, oh, I want to try this more. This is really good. Sometimes you need to threaten them. Say, if you don't do this, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You want to be responsible for the numbers. If you don't have a new RP, you might go to jail if you sign up numbers that's not real. And sometimes you have to be a hostage negotiator, saying that, you know what? I know you did this in the past, and you're not going to get away with it once we go online. So let's try to fix this together so no one will make the same mistake that you did. I'm not going to tell your boss that's what you did, but hey, help me out. Let's fix this. You have to play different roles based on the situation you're in, and your enemy changes based on your project you're in, what position or title or either power you have at that moment, and your friends can change too. I had friends that were my friends when I was touching someone else's project. When I turn and touch their project, they suddenly become my enemy. I'm like, what happened? Well, I thought we were friends. So don't take it personally. You know, it took me a long time to not to cry when my friends became my enemy or my enemy suddenly becomes my friend. Happy tears and sad tears. But you got to admit, your role is a are, are, are very difficult role and you have to play different uh, characters. 
What do you think, Adam? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Although we, I think one of the differences between Akina and me is, I think you spend a lot of time thinking about these kind of yeah. dynamics and interpersonal relationships. I'm not really wired that way. So I find it very difficult to kind of see how I could be a hostage negotiator or, or those kinds of things. But one thing I think I would take out of that, or I would definitely agree on is, the first third, when you said sometimes you need to show, like you need to show where we could be going and, and demonstrate. I do agree that it shouldn't be a 12 month or 18 month or okay. 24 month process. And that's why I, I isn't like getting a little bit in the weeds, but I think prototyping ideas is so, so important in digital. Like for anyone out there who doesn't have this capability in their team, the ability to be able to quickly put something together to show to other executives, to show other people in the business, to show clients and customers, if you have that, then people can quickly get it, and they may not even stand in your way for Start small. funding, I totally fundraising. Agree. Yeah. So, so we did that a lot, and I think um, <laughs> whether or not I can master the art of war like you, I don't know. <laughs> but at least I can demonstrate what we're thinking. Yeah. Now, an open question to to all three of you: How do you do that? How, how do you attract this new, this kind of talent to come into your company? How or how do you groom this kind of talent from ex existing um, from existing workforce? I mean, it would be good advice for a lot of you know audience in here because they do want to become the best digital follower in certain domains in there because talent's always always a focus for all of us. Do you want to go first? You know, so we were talking earlier about losing talents to you know immigration and you know doubling the pay you know from fund houses and stuff like that. Uh, I have a, 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 a policy when I hire, because what we do are very new, right? Transformation, innovative, that has not been done before. So finding people with skill sets to do this is very hard. So I don't hire people, they don't have the four A's, not because my name starts with an, uh, an A. I'm sure it doesn't. No, <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with it. Number one is attribute, don't based on experience, based on their capabilities, okay? Attitude very positive and then um at, attitude attitude and attribute right all right and then aptitude meanings ability to learn fast fail fast and move on and the last thing is adaptability because what we do we have to adapt and change really fast and then most of my uh, candidates I, I hire i threaten them i literally threaten them during interviews that if don't lie to me uh, don't bullshit what you can do and cannot do because I will fire you if you don't deliver. So yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit different. There you go. So uh, I, 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 one more A is agility, all right? Because oh. like, yeah, because we keep changing new things. We don't know what we're going to do next, you know, maybe next month, we yeah. never know. So I'll get add agility. So, so when people that, you know, I don't hire people if they start with a role with the same operation and TDS work for too long. Ah, interesting. And, that, and that's really hard for them to change. And because they, they will set up, okay, what, what is my, my scope of work? And then if you set it up, and then later, sooner or later, they will come up, okay, it's, it's not aligned mm -hmm. with what you told me before. So come on, I'm a boss. I don't even know what I need to do next tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, so how, can I, how can you set, you know, the, the, I mean, the frame solid right? frame, yeah. frame and the casting is new, because there's no way to do that. So, but, but it's really hard to get to the right candidate, but basically, you know, for digital, there's, there's no perfect candidates at all. Yeah, so yeah. maybe just Training. going in there. So you've brought them, you've interviewed, you've brought them in, which is great. How do you retain them? How do you keep them? How do you keep them interested in what you're doing? Let me well, leave the hard so, question to add. I, I thought one of your A's was going to be ambition. Oh, no, no, so, no. It turns out, I guess there's a lot of adjectives that start with A, um, but that's not what I'm going to no, talk that, about. Uh, no, like, no. I think in, in digital, you have a, because things are new, because you don't know what you're going to do the next day. I, I hate to admit that I feel that very frequently. I would love to say I have a perfect five year digital plan for Tricor. Um, but the truth is things change so quickly. Yep. It's not possible. So the nice thing or the upside about that is for people that are um, prefer rather than being deep experts and certain about what's going to happen, people that like to have um, flexibility or maybe uncertainty, it's very attractive to them. And you can give them roles like product ownership, where they're almost like a mini CEO. So one of the people that I hired uh, has responsibility for one product that we've launched where it's marketing and operations and the PNL. Now, obviously, 
I provide some air cover, the rest of the management group as well. But for someone who's 25, 28, 30, 32, being, being that kind of um, mini CEO slash product owner in a digital team can be really, really attractive. So not ambition, but um, accountability maybe. Gosh, there's a lot of- Yeah, or, or, or like um, challenge. Yeah, challenge. Right, but like uh, not being fearful. I mean, like uh, seriously, I just had a conversation with one of my staff and just leaving me. She said, "Akina, I've given you two years of my life. That's a lot." I'm like, two years is a lot." So the the mindset of the young people are very different from us. Well, like maybe more of you guys, less of me. So <laughs> just kidding. So I mean, like they think that one to two years of their life at your company is a long time. I mean, for a lot of us at least five to six to 10 years is a long time. So the, the attention span is shortened. So the only time you can keep them is like you said, give them projects, throw them new things, introduce them to new things. That's why I'm like, before my company is moving to metaverse and, and I think my chairman's really smart. He's, he's the one, the first one that says, Akina, are you looking into metaverse? I'm like, what? You know, like, you know, so you have to throw them new things all the time, challenge them and grow them and give them opportunity. And most importantly, because the things we do are so dangerous. Seriously, you can get fired for doing things we do, right? You have to protect them. You have to put a dome around your team. You face the, all the politics and all the threatening and all the negotiation, lobbying and all that stuff. And you just feed them the project and let them just focus on that. Thank you. William, I think yeah, your opinion on we need to keep to like keep the talents like keep them excited with, with like new things like challenges is, is a good word like, accountable i think you need to let, let them own something yes. we're not just like ask them to do whatever you said or the project or the task and then just ask them to follow it that, that's not going to work you know let them to own something to uh, accountable for, for the thing that they can and give them some autonomy yes yeah for the project and the product that they own and now I think they will start to grow, you know, more responsibility, particularly for those like young generation. Yeah. Right. And room for, to make mistakes and you protect them. Yeah, true. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe asking a next question in here for our, our, for our audience here. Yeah? In terms of what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest threat or risk? Is it cyber? Is it, I don't know. Could be anything. I'm curious. Yeah, I, I want to. I was actually just thinking about this as as everyone was talking. Um, c cyber is a concern, but from my perspective, <laughs> I hate to say it like this, but we're all extremely exposed, and the risks are so high that I don't actually lose a lot of sleep because you just got to do your best. If a state actor or a really serious hacking organization, something like that, wants to target you, you're going to have trouble. So just Make sure you have the, the processes in place. Make sure you have the best um, defense that you can justify for your kind of business. So that actually doesn't cause me too much too much sleep. What I lose most sleep in is, is speed and the ability to transform kind of at scale, right? So if I think about five or 10 years from now, what kind of business could, um, could corporate governance, corporate uh, entity management, those types of things that we do look like, will we be the ones to be there at the leading edge there are startups all around in this space i don't think any have become unicorns but they're you know they're 10 20 50 million us valuation companies so they have customer bases and they are coming for us so that's what causes me to lose sleep is mm -hmm. can i really have that impact can our team really have that impact that we expect okay Akina. oh god I, this is something i i, I do every day for the past uh, couple of months, because I just because part of the head of digital transformation and innovation, other do innovative stuff. So when you think of new stuff to do, what I uh, I'm afraid of, uh, what we in the middle of the night, is actually what if my idea halfway implemented, there's no support, right? Then in, internally someone kills it or stops it, it doesn't support it, and then what if my business model is wrong? And I'm not getting the traction that I promised that's supposed to come because it's so new. So if and 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 then one good thing my boss is Alex Lowe said to me that really helped me finally fell asleep was that Akina, it's okay. If that doesn't go out as planned, we're not gonna die. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, but that's so, sorry if I can we just have yeah, a bit no, of chat no, about this because um that ability of others in the organization as peers and, and people above you in like the board or senior management or whatever to accept that there may sometimes be failure, I still think is quite is too rare. 
it is uh, rare. Like to be able to say, okay, we've started this project six months in, we've done some prototypes, we've done an MVP. Looks like it's not going to work. Looks the business model is wrong, too costly, whatever it is. Okay, let's move on and try something new. It's not the way most people think, right? I'm going to give credit to one organization called HKB, and the CEO did an amazing job. Nick said that when we fail in a project, let's look at our failure. Let's share with the whole freaking company why we failed, what we did wrong, so we can all learn and not make the same mistake. I mean, that kind of, of culture, mindset, and attitude makes HKBN a successful company, you know? Yeah, I think that, you know, that, that's exactly how we're doing right now. It's like, at least that we need to share the failures in detail, every single details, you know, within the team first. And then, because like, you, you can't, by the way, and then somehow when you like propose something to the management, don't set too high expectation. Because every time they will ask them like, first of all, ROI, definitely, right? Return, what is it return? That's the problem. When okay. you do something so new, you do not have precedence about an ROI. You just can't. Yeah, but just, you yeah. need to project it, right? And then you need to give them some, you know, whatever. Yeah. I think it's ten million. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, <clears throat> some of that, and then they, they need to understand that okay, it's not guaranteed just yeah. as at every time. And then, but usually, I think most of the management they they, they would say, okay, I accept that. But if you really fail, and then that would be another story, all right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Bye, William. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the fifth is you need to explain why and then what you did wrong, and then be transparent. Don't hide anything. Yeah. And then that, that's what how we do to my staff, and, you know, but they are also how you communicate with the stakeholder because because they are actually they're willing to invest in something new and they were they're willing to in the way, even though they don't know whether it was success or not, but like at least you need to tell them the truth and share with them. Okay, thank you, thank you. We've only a few minutes small before the end of our panel, and my last question to each one of you, maybe starting with you, you William, is what makes you happy at work? Uh, okay, good question. Okay, challenges. Okay, and um, achievement, of course, but achievement including failures. Because I want, if I can success in something, success in something, I would like to know what I did wrong. All right, that that's keep me improved. So, just a recap, yeah. So challenges, successes, and failures. These yeah. are things that keep you happy and motivated at work. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Adam, can, can I have two? You, you can have three. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm only going to have two. No. Okay, so number one is every new release. So every day we re-release a, a version of our, our some of our products, maybe every couple of weeks or every week. Every day I get that email that says, here's the new features that came out that could be great for customers or maybe they won't work. That makes me happy, every new release. And second of all, <laughs> especially because we're kind of in the, the startup mode of launching more and new digital products. It's every time I get the update that new clients have joined. So every day, maybe 10 or 20 new on board makes me happy. That's what makes me happy. So new products and services being released and also more customers for people enjoying your products in there. Oh, good. Very good. Nikina. Well, every time I convert someone within my company that looks for change, that influence uh, that someone who speaks up, not in my team, but in another department that speaks up, look for change and push for change. It makes me so happy because now I have a replicate of me, right? And that, that, not that I think I'm awesome, but it's just because I think there's another change agent out there. And then that will make any transformation much quicker than just by myself. That's, I, I really see the big difference and I, I, and I talk to these people and I said, you made my job and my existence in this company worth more than anything. So it's good. So for you, it's about stakeholder recognition and confirmation. No, not more, no. Uh, more are there uh, mindset change. Mindset. So more, when you convert more. someone of your peers yes. or in there, take you change. Yeah. It makes you feel valued and important to, your, to the organization. I think that I added value because there's more people pushing for transformation. It's not because of me. I, I, and one, one of our strategy, I mean, and Adam was there, one of my things I do teach is using art of war, Sun Tzu Bing Fa, Sun Ji Bing Fa, for digital transformation. And one of the things that I advocate is do not take credit for your work at all. Do not. 
Adam, you want to say? No, I was going to say, do we have time to answer that question yes, that's we on do. the board? So, I, I actually like this question. So the question, do you mind if I read it? Go for it. Yeah, okay. I can see it down there. <laughs> Ooh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, when you start small and build a new function like machine learning, chatbots, new data optimization tool, how long do you give it to succeed and how or who measures it? So I like the first part of this question, which is how long? I actually don't think there's a, like, you don't say, okay, we're going to try artificial intelligence for three months. Three months happens, oh, we don't have artificial intelligence now, let's just give up, right? All these things, like your points about converting people in the organization, they're all consistent applied pressure and force over time. So if our first chatbot doesn't work, we don't stop, we would maybe pick it up again in, in three or six months, learn from the mistakes, like uh, I think you mentioned about HKBN. And I think um, that's the way that, that I approach it. Rather than being kind of a, a time delimited thing, it's more like a, a constant, yeah. constant force. And you may just try from different angles. And not only that, right? I love that what you picked up was time because I, I'm, well, I'm a little bit older, so I can say this. 20 years ago, online shopping for grocery was not HKTV. Oh, sorry. It was, it's called something web, web grocery, or something like that in the US. It failed because of timing. But in, the, the good thing about startups or technology world is that they never give up. They continue until it sticks. When you believe something has a value, stick to it. Find different cases to support it. It's not one case is going to make it work for especially something so new. So timing should not be the measurement of success. It should be which case study, which user base makes most sense and where and when. Can you push and push and push until it happens? I think it's more is like I mean, more important is like you keep making progress. Yeah. That's another thing. You, yeah. you don't set a definite timeline yeah. forever that whether it's success or not, but like you need to set keep them progress. Yeah. So it's like I we, we did a uh, data project in China. Yeah, that that's first ever data analytics project in in our company for China consumer markets or the shopping malls. Uh, we take like six months around less than six months actually four to five months to have the first dashboard to come out. And then we start asking them using. And then it took some time for them to adopt to the new, you know, analytic tools or whatever. But we keep them progress. And then how they, and then later on we give us new insight and we we help the user to convert the finding into business action. And then it helps. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks William, Adam and Akina for your time and for sharing with the audience here today. Great insights, great, great nuggets in there what makes you happy as a, as a CDO or person in your role how do you hide the talent how do you retain the talent and some thanks for sharing all the fun things that you actually are doing as well thank you very much thanks thank you thank you